Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul welcomes back Dr. Mark Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney is a visionary thinker, social activist, and passionate philosopher. He is known for his source code teachings, including unique self-theory, the five cells, the amorous cosmos, a politics of evolutionary love, a return to eros, and digital intimacy. He is the author of over 25 books and holds a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University, as well as orthodox rabbinic ordination. He teaches on the cutting edge of philosophy and spirit in the West, with the aim of participating in the articulation of what Dr. Gaffney, together with Dr. Zach Stein and colleagues, are calling cosmoerotic humanism. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow, help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy the conversation between Paul and Mark as they talk about awakening to love. Hello, everybody. Before we get into the podcast today, I have a very special life-transforming offer. I have created a three-day Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop that is perfect for Living 4D subscribers and listeners. I have broken up the three-day workshop to enhance your learning experience. My upcoming Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop will be conducted over the span of several weeks so that you don't have to do too much training at once and you have time to integrate what you learn between training sessions. I will offer day one on June 30th the second day of training, July 14th. And to conclude the three days of training, we will meet on July 29th, where I'm offering a powerful day of practicing Czech life process alchemy with me to facilitate your own healing, spiritual growth, and to integrate all that was taught in the previous two days of training. Day three of the workshop combines an on-learning option with the option to attend live at our beautiful home in the mountains of Fallbrook, California. Check Life Process Alchemy is a structured system to help not just the coach, trainer, therapist, or doctor, but to help anyone who is genuinely interested in their own healing. Check Life Process Alchemy is a very powerful system for personal, professional, and spiritual growth and helps anyone identify the actual cause of their own physical, emotional, or mental symptoms or any patient or client symptoms. After many years of studying alchemy and different systems of alchemy, I found that there were too many contradictions between the systems of alchemy to be a reliable means of addressing the spectrum of physical, emotional, mental, relationship, social, or spiritual challenges effectively. I took it upon myself to spend countless hours researching, studying, practicing, and investigating how to create an integrated system of alchemy that worked effectively and consistently. By integrating Carl Jung's and Rudolf Steiner's concepts of alchemy with classical alchemy concepts, I was finally able to create a system that includes the key physiological and psychological control systems that directly affect the human body, emotions, mind, and soul. I have now tested my Czech Life Process Alchemy system for many years and have taught it privately to therapists and with my life coaching clients, and it produces accurate results every time. A few years ago, I was the keynote speaker for the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine's 30-year anniversary and offered a two-day Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop to seasoned Oriental medical doctors, acupuncturists, students of Oriental medicine, and a variety of other healthcare professionals. It was very well received, and the most common comment I got was, why have I been studying and practicing all these years and nobody has ever taught us how to get to the actual cause of people's problems like this? Not only did the students in my workshop learn a lot of very practical approaches to their patient work, they learned a lot about themselves, which was quite enlightening for them, and I'm sure it will be for each of you too. This workshop will help you to understand how spirit creates and embodies itself through our mind, elemental forces, our physiology, regulatory systems, emotions, and the circumstances of our life. You will learn how to identify the actual causes of psychophysical imbalances and how to balance, heal, and grow yourself spiritually. You will learn how to guide yourself, life coaching clients, or patients through the Czech Life Process Alchemy process and the stages of healing that I teach. Practicing Czech Life Process Alchemy will facilitate conscious awakening and offer you greater freedom in life in a simple but dynamic format. You will learn a structured system of self or patient assessment, progression, awareness training, and behavioral change that is highly complementary to other holistic coaching therapies and training techniques and is ideal for all Czech trained professionals. Czech Life Process Alchemy uses key principles of alchemy, physiology, Jungian depth psychology, the four functions of consciousness, and the assessment of an individual's life story. 
Check Life Process Alchemy shows you how to resolve root causes of psychophysical challenges and facilitate anyone's ability to accomplish their dreams or goals for health, abundance, and life. As I mentioned earlier, the training will be conducted over three separate days online with the option to join me in person for the practice and integration training on day three. Within the first two days of online training, June 30th and July 14th, I will give you simple practical homework exercises to orient you to the practice of check life process alchemy in your daily life or practice it with your clients and patients. Day 3, July 29th, you can choose to come to do the integration and practice training live or attend online. During Day 3, I will draw from students in class to demonstrate how to use your Czech Life Process Alchemy training and the principles of Czech Life Process Alchemy to solve real health, mental, emotional, or life challenges. Due to the personal, social, and cultural issues we're all facing in the world today, I felt compelled to offer each of you this opportunity to learn very powerful healing, stress reduction, and spiritual growth methods that really work. I feel this is important training, so I'm offering you the three-day training event for the same price I normally charge for my two-day workshops. I have created 17 three- to four-minute videos to introduce you to the concepts of Czech Life Process Alchemy so you can see if it resonates with your soul and you'd like to attend. They will be released progressively as the workshop approaches, and you can see each of them that have been released at the workshop sign-up page or follow me on my Instagram channel at paul.check. Remember that C-H-E-K, at paul.check. The introductory videos are in the Reels section. To register for my upcoming Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop, go to mailchi.mp forward slash paulcheck forward slash clpa. That's mailchi.mp forward slash paulcheck forward slash clpa. Once again, that's mailchi.mp forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K, forward slash C-L-P-A. I'm super excited to have as many of you in this training as possible, and also super excited to have as many of you here live at our Rainbow House as possible, so we can share a lot of amazing insights and ahas and get clear together and go off into the world and do our best to make it a better place for everybody. Well, I'm super excited to have Mark Gaffney back with me today. I'm sure some of you listened to our last podcast and you know that there's soul brother chemistry going on between us because we both have a lot of things that we resonate on and today is going to be no different. We are going to talk about really an important topic today. The title of the show is Awakening to Love. And I think love's probably one of the most important things there is to talk about. So, Mark, it's just such a great joy to have you back with me again today. And I had so much fun with you last time. I'm still high off of it. Oh, my God. First off, I'm, I'm madly delighted to see you. Right? And, Thank you. And I, I, I love you. And, you know, to meet someone at a particular moment in life, you know, who is, you know, new in the most beautiful way. And you can feel their depth and their world and, and you know, just the, the enormous, immense versatility and gorgeousness of, of reality being Paul is a mad <laughs> delight. And so I'm, I'm madly delighted to meet and, and to kind of step in deeply with you and to try and do a series of podcasts that actually begin to articulate an evolution of the source code for culture, right? That we're, we're not interested in. We love casual conversation, but we're trying to actually participate in evolving the source code at this moment of metacrisis. So from that perspective, I'm going to suggest a new title for the show, right? (laughs) which, (laughs) Which is, right, something like, you know, when we say awakening to love, we have to know what love means. We, We can just start in the middle, which is this huge mistake people have about love, which is that love at its core is an emotion. So I want to just that love is, I mean, that's not a bad, you know, maybe title. Love is not an emotion. That's a great place to start. It has an emotional component. We feel love. And it's the universe feels, the universe feels, and the universe feels love. And so we, we need to explain that. But, but love as a faculty isn't only a feeling, right? Love is a, a perception, right? And that's very, very important because if love is an emotion, 
in the way that emotion is used in the psychological parlance of contemporary psychology, which is mostly semi-materialistic, you know, personal psychology, 11 different schools. And emotion is a quality of energy in motion, which ultimately peters out. Well, not only not, not only that, if I could just quickly interject, an emotion is always in response to something. So, so an emotion is that absolutely, brother. So an emotion and, is and love reaction. is primary. The emotion is secondary. So, so right, so beautiful, beautiful, my friend. So, so love is not merely an emotion, which is a reaction. Love is an action, right? Love is right. So, but let's just begin with love as a perception. Because a perception is not a reaction. A perception is formative. When we say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, we don't mean that beauty is subjective. Oh, beauty is just in the eyes of the beholder. No, no, we mean beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, meaning the faculty of the perceiver actually discloses the beauty. So perception is this radically active notion. When I, when I, when I was in Dharamsala, and I think I had told you I had had a, a fight with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Annoying. You know, and so we, we're in Dharamsala and I'm in his room and we're talking and sharing. And he said, what's the most important thing you can tell me, you know, from Jerusalem? I said, love's not an emotion, love's a perception. Mm. And he was delighted and he, he, you know, did that beautiful childish thing that he does, which is, you know, very beautiful because you need to be an old man and a child at the same time. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And of course, his 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 childlike delight qualities have gotten him a little trouble these few weeks. So let's send him a blessing. I've heard, yeah, I've seen. <laughs> I don't know what to believe anymore with all the social media, though. You know, they I've man, seen how people can rig videos and stuff. So I mean, I, I'm just gonna tell you, just let me say my one Dalai Lama thing. Dalai Lama's a good man, and you know, I think there was a cultural misunderstanding there, right? That's yeah. that's my my sense of that. But but the point is back to love as a perception. That means that when I met you, right, and we talked for a few hours, so every few minutes that we talked and we got to know each other and see each other more deeply, our love grows because our perception grows. If I get together with someone, love is an emotion. And so the emotion is kind of flaring and flowing and, and it's moving. And then we know each other a little more and then we get familiar. And then I kind of know your belly and I kind of know your moods and I know your breasts and I, you know, and I know <laughs> your reactions, right? And it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of gone, right? Because the emotion kind of slowly dies. But if love is a perception, right? Right. Meaning, meaning, so every moment that I know you, right, whether I love Paul or Paul loves Mark or Paul loves Penny or Mark loves Christina, right, whoever we love, right, perception means that in 10 years from now, it's going to be infinitely deeper. Yeah. So notion that love is an emotion destroys love because we understand emotion as being a kind of psychological materialist phenomena based on, you know, novelty or, or meeting of needs of certain kind of superficial forms or comfort. No, love is a perception. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes, right? To be a lover is to see with God's eyes or to be a lover is, is I actually, I literally see you as God sees you. I move from my side to God's side, which is the way the 19th century mystical texts call it. I move from mitsidenu to mitsido. From our side, the human perspective, I move to the perspective of the infinite and I see you through the eyes of the infinite. So I see you with God's eyes and now I'm, I'm blown open by your beauty. And that perception deepens. So, so the that loves an emotion destroys love. Let's just get that. It's a great realization. No, the emotion emerges from the depth of seeing, from the depth of perception and last sense, right? Which is, and then to love God is to let God see through your eyes, right? To love God is I clarify my perception so clearly that God's now looking through me in a way that God can't look, that infinity can't see that unique perspective of beauty other than looking through Paul Check's eyes. And when Paul clarifies his own vision and God sees through Paul's eyes, that's Paul madly loving God. Paul loves God by letting God see through Paul's eyes, yes. Yeah, I, I think- God, there's good to see you. Yeah, you too. And, and you know, the problem when I talk to you is I got a 50 million things that pop into my head and I feel like, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? Whoa, 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 go, go, go. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fun. Uh, you know, but you see, I'm going to jump ahead to one of my definitions of love because it is very 
directly related to what you're saying that love, you, you know, you can say love is perception or you can say love as perception, but right on the top of the list that I'm about to get to, one of the definitions I created for love by just talking to the God in me called my soul and asking for definitions, love is consciousness becoming aware of itself. Okay, so when you when you say, okay, love is consciousness, that's primary, and perception and consciousness are mirrors of each other. You can't, if you don't have perception, you're not conscious of anything. No, that's that's very beautiful. Let's well, let's work with that. Love is consciousness, right? Becoming aware of itself. So let let's see if we can work with that because I think we need to start with something kind of primary and accessible. And knowing what love is matters because because if you want to understand the nature of reality, reality is eros. Let's start there. Reality is eros. That's what reality is. Now, eros is a word that I like better than love for lots of reasons, right? The word love has somehow grown stale, right? We've killed Yeah, all like God. <laughs> right, right. Like, like, that's correct. Love and God, right? We actually don't know what those words mean anymore. So they've grown stale and there's a lot of baggage associated with them. But what's true is that we've killed all the gods and goddesses except for Aphrodite, who's the goddess of love, but we, we don't know how to worship at our altar. And our sacred creed is I love you, but we don't quite know what it means. So, so I like the word eros because eros speaks of something wider and broader than love, which is all too often what I call ordinary love, which is a kind of mere human sentiment, a kind of social construction. So I'm going to use the word eros with your permission. Yeah, whatever. Gonna... Yeah, I understand because I've eros. studied enough of your work to know the depth of what you mean with that word. And so let's work with that word. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So I want to offer an interior science equation. And I, by the way, I'm madly excited about this for the last decade i've been working on trying to create you know with a, a whole group of interlocutors a group of interior science equations which are the the values of cosmos and, and we actually need to reconstruct value and that the, the postmodern deconstruction of value which really began in modernity is actually undermining the very fabric of society and that postmodern deconstruction is at the center of the world economic forum and its movements. And so the reconstruction of value is the overwhelming moral imperative of this moment in response to suffering. So one of the ways we're working on doing this at the, at the center, the Center for Integral Wisdom, is, is to actually reconstruct value theory. And the central value of cosmos is eros. So I want to offer with permission and then relate it to your, and we'll, talk, we'll go back and forth, relate it to your definition of love. I want to offer an interior science equation for Eros. Yeah, okay. I've got a few definitions, as you know, so I'll throw no, them fantastic. on the pile once you totally. get... We'll throw them on the pile. Yeah, we're, no, we're working together to create a language of value. And at the center of our language of value is the central value of reality. And reality is actually a cosmo-erotic universe. And the central value of reality is Eros. So here's an Eros equation. And and I've spent, I know, like last decade losing a lot of sleep about formulating this equation properly. So it's, it, it's you know, it's with a lot of intention and, and a lot of, you know, gentleness and, and, and audacity and humility and, and also trembling because we, Good. we went to this core equation. It's critical because it's the nature of reality all the way up and all the way down the evolutionary chain. So just like Einstein creates e equals MC squared, which changes exterior sciences. So we need to change the inner physics of reality. And we do that through interior sciences. And we need to actually begin to take interior sciences seriously and actually create interior science equations. So here's one of them coming at you. What is Eros? Right? So here's a, here's a definition. Here's an interior science equation. So Eros equals the experience of radical aliveness, seeking, moving towards, desiring, ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. Yeah. So Eros equals, and, and maybe, I don't know if we can, I, I could write it up, we could put it across the screen so people could see it, but Eros equals the experience of radical aliveness, moving towards seeking, desiring, ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. And that Eros is in the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang 
and it governs the self-actualizing cosmos, the self-organizing universe, all the way through the world of matter, all the way through the biosphere, all the way through the human world, right? It's Eros all the way up and it's Eros all the way down, right? That's a, that's a incredibly world changing re-understanding of cosmos. What is reality? Reality is Eros. Eros animates the four forces, the strong and the weak nuclear, the electromagnetic, right, the gravitational. Eros drives everything. So for example, sexuality is one expression of the erotic. The sexual is not the erotic. There's 12 billion years of Eros before there's any sex, right? So the sexual models the erotic. It doesn't exhaust the erotic. But now back to your definition of love. So eros is not just, I mean, eros, which is love, is the eros of cosmos is actually completely engaged in this process of becoming, and it seeks its desires ever deeper manifestation, ever deeper uniqueness, ever deeper complexity, ever deeper intimacy, ever deeper joy, ever deeper goodness, ever deeper beauty, ever more value. So cosmos has an appetite. Its appetite is for more eros. And that eros is actually animating Paul and Mark. And if you'd ask me, who is Paul? I'd say Paul is a unique configuration of eros. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That never was, is, or will be. Now, when eros breaks down, then ethics break down. In other words, it's read that the collapse of eros causes a failure of ethics. Now, when we say consciousness becomes aware of itself, and I'm gonna I'm gonna push back here a little bit, right? Because that's what we do. See, the problem with consciousness becomes aware of itself, which is absolutely true, is that you actually don't feel the pulse. It almost feels like an abstract thing happening over there. Consciousness is becoming aware of itself. It's more like Eros is the pulsing movement of reality. And as reality manifests wider and deeper visions of goodness, truth, and beauty, in each one of those new visions, consciousness experiences itself in that new form. So I'm a deer, I'm a gazelle, right? You know, I'm a wild boar, right? I'm a plant right? Yeah. I'm a human being. I'm Paul, right? So consciousness yeah. has this sudden, shocking self-recognition of Paul, but, but consciousness is not just aware of itself as love, right? It's actually active, right? So in other words, love is always in action. So evolution is love and action. Evolution equals love and action. So love is never merely awareness, which is one of the Buddhist kind of influences on contemporary human potential thought which is actually deleterious, right? Because Buddhism always thinks about things in terms of awareness. And I don't like the term, right? You know, and, and don't get too mad at me. I apologize. I don't like the term awareness, right? Because it's not arousing. And if it's not arousing, it's not true, right? In other words, so I would say not awareness. I would say consciousness, right, comes alive. Consciousness pulses. Consciousness throbs, right, with its new experiences, right, that it has through the process of the evolutionary unfolding. So consciousness both contains all future experience and consciousness also emerges, evolves until it becomes newly aware of itself in these new forms. But, 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 but it's, it's more than awareness because awareness is, is, it's too placid of a word, right? It's more like consciousness is, think of and I don't know, you, you might be celibate. I, I know that I understand that. But if you've ever know someone who's had sex and you have, they could tell you about how that experience works, Paul. So ask them what their best sexual experience was. Like your best, most wild, most gorgeous, most sacred sexual experience. That's what consciousness feels like, mm. right? So you don't say to your beloved, right, throes of ecstasy, hey, sweetie, I'm aware of you. She'll slap you, right? You say, <laughs> Right? You say, you say to her, I'm blown open by your radiance. My eyes are dazzled. My heart is melted. Right. So I want I want to find a word which is beyond awareness because awareness, right? You know, awareness doesn't connote. It doesn't capture. Maybe I'll say about, one last. 
How about, honey, I'm wearing you. I'm, I'm right. right. I'm wearing you. You are my clothes. You are my, my guard. You are my beauty. I mean, take Sat Chit Ananda in, in, in Kashmir Shaivism, the root tradition of Hinduism. So Sat is being. Chit is consciousness. But Ananda is ecstatic, pulsing bliss, eros. So, so the outside, right, or the, the kind of, Sat is the kind of the first sense of this pure being, but then the inside of Sat is cheat, right? Which is consciousness. But then the inside of consciousness is Ananda, bliss, love, Eros, pulsing, throbbing, dripping, tumescent. So the inside of the inside is Eros. And, and when I say awareness, you know, if I can give it to you, if I, when I say awareness, something wilts inside of us. We're like awareness. Oh, Really? You want awareness? So you want, you want eros, you want aliveness. So, so I want to kind of reclaim the full throbbing aliveness, right, of the erotic experience, which has nothing to do with the sexual. The sexual is, tw- that's 12 billion years later, right? In other words, so, so that throbbing aliveness lives everywhere. So I've got my desk here, right? Or let me get, not my desk, I have a, a glass. Here's my glass, okay? So this glass looks like a glass. But if I actually know what's happening in this glass, not not mystically, scientifically, this glass is actually a throbbing, pulsing, right, expression, right, of dancing eros, quite literally, right, of subatomic particles and particles, right, and atoms, right, moving in this unimaginably beautiful cacophony, right, of erotic movement. And I think I'm just holding a glass. And when you hold a glass, by the way, if you let or anything. Right? You, you actually let yourself feel what this is. And you begin to realize, oh, the world of matter, even before we get to life, self-actualizes. It self-organizes. What's driving it? Eros. Right? It's completely alive. Right? It's, it's sentient all the way down. And that's why the environmental movement doesn't work, because we forget to fall in love with the world of matter. Right? It's alive. Right? Did you remember Lord of the Rings? Lord of yep. the Rings? Movie two? Movie two? The I don't tree. remember it that well. The trees, it's the, the, the tale of the two towers. The trees join in the battle of Helm's Deep. The trees come alive and they join in. So the trees are alive and, and the earth is alive. It's all living. We're, we're living in the lap of full eros and radical aliveness. And awareness just takes a little bit into the world of just awareness or when, when you meditate in the contemporary you know, kind of world spirituality, people are doing awareness and awareness of awareness. And it's very beautiful, but, but actually it's, it's pulsing and it's alive and it's eros. And, and the reason that's so important is there's no ethics without it. Ethics, it's down when you lose connection, right? To the full eros of your actual experience of life. And then you feel this hole, you feel this emptiness. So then you seek to cover it over and you cover it over not with real eros because you can't access that. You cover it over with this fake eros, with this pseudo eros. And pseudo eros is always the covering over of the whole when you've lost access to the, the true eros of reality that's pulsing in every minute. The, so it's a cosmoerotic universe like that. So that, that would be my, 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 the beginning of a response if that's okay, brother. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm sure grateful to have you on this journey with me and listening to the podcast and picking up new and interesting ways that we can all work together to make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about Paleo Valley's new wild-caught fish row. Have you ever tried wild-caught fish row? I grew up on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and each year during the salmon run, fish row was plentiful, and when I'd eat it, I could just feel my body saying yes and wanting more. And that is exactly what happens every time I use Paleo Valley's carefully freeze-dried, wild-caught fish row capsules. Fish row is an excellent addition to your daily health plan and is prized around the world by various cultures containing an array of beneficial nutrients you'd get with whole food fish. Paleo Valley's wild-caught fish row comes from fish caught by sustainably-minded fishermen committed to preserving fish runs for future generations, and it's super clean and healthy. 
It gives your body a great dose of easily absorbed omega-3 fatty acids, which are super important and helpful. In fact, a recent study found 68% of American adults are not consuming enough omega-3s, and 89% had levels in the dangerously low range associated with high cardiovascular risk. Omega-3 deficiencies can cause imbalances in the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio, causing things like unhealthy levels of inflammation, low energy levels, poor memory, joint discomfort, dry skin, heart problems, mood swings, and even depression. Fish roe is rich in essential long-chain omega-3 fatty acids from eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and dicosahexaenoic acid, DHA, which have been linked to less inflammation in consumers, improved cognitive function, healthy mood and mental health, better vision, healthy blood pressure, supported cardiovascular health, and strong immune function, and more. Plus, Paleo Valley wild caught fish roe is enhanced with other additional compounds and nutrients such as protein, DPA, choline, selenium, vitamins E, C, D, B2, and phospholipids for added benefits. To get your Paleo Valley fish row, go to paleovalley.com forward slash check 15. That's P A L E O valley.com forward slash C H E K 15. Living 4D listeners save 15% on purchase using the code C H E K 15 at checkout. Check 15. If you're interested in research to back anything I've shared here, feel free to reach out to Paleo Valley and they can help you. Enjoy feeling great eating Paleo Valley's wild-caught fish row capsules each day. I love them, and I use them every day. I think I, I, think I need to, to break this down for you because... Go, I'm with you're, you. You're, you're taking it as it's written, but what I had to do... When I, whenever I create a definition, I try to make it as succinct as I can so that it's memorable... So let me share with you what it means to me. So when it says love is consciousness, the highest form of God is unconditional love. The highest form of consciousness is unconditional. It's the carrier of what we are conscious of. So in the definition, when I say love is consciousness, I mean big C, that which is bearing witness to and experiencing all that can be known or experienced, which by definition, to be conscious of something, it has to have polarity to it. This is why I like Edward Edinger's definition of consciousness. Consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. So if we take the Holy Trinity at the top, you would have in my model zero neutral. Holy Ghost would be zero negative or Bohm's implicate order. Zero positive would be explicate or that which can be known, weighed, or measured as things or matter or, or form. And so if we go at the top, we have God. Then at the left, Holy Spirit, we've got Shakti. And on the right, we've got Shiva. So zero neutral is big C. It's behind everything. I give the example to my students that Big C is like a dance floor. It doesn't do anything, but I ask him, if you were the dance floor, could a mosquito walk on you without you know it, knowing it? Everyone says no. Could you do anything on that dance floor, even sing without it knowing? No. Everything that happens is frequency or vibration, and the dance floor is going to know it. So big C for me is the dance floor, and the dance is what we would call things that we can be conscious of. Okay, so when I say love is consciousness, I'm saying love is God as that which is beyond polarity but is engaged in polarity, becoming aware of itself through acts and experiences of love, which you are referring to as arrow. So Beautiful. That's, that's that first. I love that unpacking. That was gorgeous. So thank you. Thank you for that gorgeousness. And I... I I'm completely aligned. Now I now I understand. So so in this understanding, right, and we're saying actually the same thing in somewhat different language, but, but they, they align. That's what's their- fun about it. That's what I love about your work because you say many of the same things that have come to me through my meditations, life experiences, and studies, but you you have this um linguistic, historic, 
you know, you come from a lot of study of Hebrew and Judaism and things that I haven't gone even a fraction as deep as you. So not only do I get to see these concepts, it's like I'm looking at a different facet of the diamond, but there are different ways of relating, which is really interesting too, right? Like I can, I can take my mental construct and, and even my felt construct of love or any other topic. And as I'm listening to the erotic and the holy, the self or things that you've read or podcasts that you've done, I'm actually feeling as though I am getting an experience of what it likes, what it's like to, to look at love through the Hebrew culture or look at love through the Jewish culture or look at love through the experience of Mark. And to me, to me, that's, 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 beautiful. that's, that's why beautiful. we need each other. That's why love, because love is relationship. Like love is relationship. Well, let's take a step a beautiful, gorgeous brother. So let's take a step at a time first, right? Just to be, I want to just clarify in the erotic and the holy, which is, you know, that, that CD set or in self, I'm, I'm working with just you on just to share just a kind of intimate personal, but the way I, hear the whispers of Shekhinah, right, of she, right, or of the love intelligence, you know, organizing, you know, into a new pattern, right, a new world philosophy. We call it cosmorotic humanism, right, this kind of, you know, new world philosophy, kind of like romanticism or existentialism, which can become a new story of value, and we kind of operate across fields, so what I'm doing is I actually have a, when, when I'm trying to articulate an idea in this new world story of value, what actually happens for me is it's not so much that I go to Jewish sources or what I, I never use the word Jewish, although not because we don't like Jewish, but because it actually, it's got an ethnic connotation. And I'm, I use the word Hebrew wisdom. So I was raised in Hebrew wisdom sources and kind of Aramaic and Hebrew sources. And then I went from there deep into science. So I kind of spent a lot, a lot of time in science, then deep into different forms of Buddhism, right? And different forms of Christianity and different forms of Kashmir Shaivism and different forms of, you know, the 11 schools of psychology and then, you know, into molecular biology. So what I tried to do was step out of the lineage and step into and try and master as much as I could facets of many different lineages of wisdom and then bring them back together, you know, in my heart in a kind of new synergy. So kind of what we need to do today is we need to try and swallow cultural whole in this Renaissance way, right? Bring together the validated insights of all the different wisdom traditions, and then weave them together into a new whole. So what's happening in the erotic and the holy is I'm using lineage sources, but actually, and especially in the book self and a unique self book is I'm trying to, and and, and absolutely in the new writings of cosmorotic humanism is that Hebrew wisdom is one source, right? Which was for me a formative source. So I always go back to the masters, but it's not actually, I'm not actually restating Hebrew wisdom. It's more like we're trying to take all of the world wisdom traditions and weave them together, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern into a new story of value, just to kind of clarify, that's just to clarify kind of what we're doing because that's, that's crazy important. Right. Having said that, when we think about love, and let's just go back to love here. Right. When we think about love, when we think about Eros, why does it matter? But why does this conversation matter? Why do we care about this conversation? Why are we having this conversation? So we're having it because we need to know where we are and who we are and what there is to do. Because we're, we're at this moment of meta crisis and, and why we, we are. Right. Well, and, and I particularly leave out why, and I'll tell you why in a second. I specifically don't put why there. I think we can leave the why out, actually. Right. That, that I think we can actually talk about, you know, who am I? Where am I? And what's there to do? And in a certain sense, the why question kind of disappears. It's kind of like the moment before erotic bliss. You don't ask why. You just, what's there to do? Who? And where am I? Here I am. So I think the why question becomes a lot of theology. We actually paradoxically can leave it out. Well, it's, it I, it might for you, but I'll when you're ready, I'll I'll put the why okay. in. Okay, you no, so you put the why in. Okay, so I'll do the who where. So I'll do who where what. You got the why. Okay. Yeah, and then I got something to bring up 
when you're ready okay. about a previous statement. Okay, previous statement. Okay, so let's just, just uh, briefly just on love. So why does this conversation about Eros matter? And you, you articulated gorgeously in your language, and I articulated in the language of Eros. It, it matters because who I am, and it was that sense that I really wanted to, who I am is I'm a unique configuration of Eros. Right. Eros is moving through me. And the Eros of cosmos moves through me. Another word for Eros, brother, is desire. Desire is the base of Eros. We've lost the dignity of desire. We've lost access to our own aliveness. And so what happens is, right, when we lose access to our personhood, which is a unique expression of our eros, then we get lost. We get our attention gets hijacked in a kind of technocratic web structure. We actually lose access, right, to the erotic quality of being alive, which is the source of our wisdom, the source of our goodness, the source of our truth, the source of our beauty. So who am I? I am a unique configuration of eros. Where am I? I live in a cosmoerotic universe. What's there to do? What's there to do is that which Eros needs for me in the next second. Another word for Eros is what I call outrageous love, as opposed to ordinary love. Ordinary love is love which is a social construct, the kind of love that Harari will talk about, or you know, Klaus Schwab will talk about it. They'll use it as a kind of social construct that we manipulate. But that's not what love is. Eros is not love is not mere human sentiment. Love's the heart of existence itself. And it's where I am. So what what is there to do? What there is to do is to commit my outrageous acts of love, right? To actually be a lover, right? To actually yes. be eros personified, be love in action. So now let's just track this for a second. I, I, I flip it back to you, holy brother. So who am I? I'm a unique configuration of eros. Who are we? We are a unique self-symphony of eros. Where do we live? We live in a cosmorotic universe. Reality is eros all the way up and all the way down. What's there to do? commit my outrageous acts of love, give the unique gift that emerges from my unique quality of intimacy, my unique configuration of Eros. That's it. Those three questions. If we just get clarity on those three questions, we literally change the source code of Cosmos. Because Cosmos is always, as Turing pointed out in More for Genesis, and his you know, 1948 essay that he did at Bell Lab, Turing, the, the code cracker in World War I, then went to Bell, Bell Lab, you know, Turing, you know, correctly points out that it's simple first rules that iterate a complicated system. So he's talking about exteriors. Let's now apply that to interiors. And the interior face of cosmos, which is culture, there's simple first rules. Simple first rules are answers to who, where, and what. So now we've now answered who. These are I call these the three great questions of cosmoerotic humanism. Who, where, and what. So this is not a theoretical conversation we're having. Reality is eros means, right, I'm a unique configuration of eros. Right, I have a unique gift to give. That is my eros expressed. I have something to do. Right, I evolution is eros and action that can be uniquely expressed only by me. My unique outrageous acts of love. And again, where am I? I'm not in a reductive materialist universe, as the MIT Media Lab, for example, conceptualizes reality, or as Larry Page right conceptualizes reality. Larry Page has this very clear conception of a materialistic reality which is depersonalized in which there's no inherent eros. And therefore he wants to essentially build a digital God. That's kind of Larry Page, the founder of Google. That's basically where he's going. So we need to actually access the ground of eros, which is the cosmorotic universe. And once I get that, who, where, and what? So that's why this conversation matters so immensely. So to you, my brother. Yeah, thank you for your, your gentle and, and tender. Well, here's some... Kung Fu for you. Let's do it. Kung Fu, let's do this, sir. Okay. Stick with me. It, I'm it with just you. so turns out that the who is the why. God, by definition, is that for which there is no other. God. The true who becomes the, the why. That's the, true. The, 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 the God, that for which there is no other, unconditional, has to create conditions so that it can know and experience itself and love itself unconditionally without a lover and a beloved, an I and a thou. Love has no currency. It has no mechanism of flow or experience. So the, the why is because God has to dream itself into existence to have the relationships that give it the capacity for experience and self-reflection 
Because though God is said to know everything, knowing something does not mean that you have experienced it. There's, if I train you as a cardiac surgeon for four years, and I wheel your mother in as your first patient, and even though you've passed all your tests, and I say, here's your first patient, your mother's having a heart attack, she needs open heart surgery right now, you're going to be scared to death because your knowledge has never been experienced, and therefore there's no wisdom in it. So without the experience of love and relationship, God's knowing is unchecked, and therefore it is just digital data on a hard drive doing nothing. That's gorgeous. That's great. You said like 16 gorgeous things. I want to focus just on one of them because the first sentence was so, the whole thing was gorgeous, but let's just focus on the first sentence because it was so beautiful and so important. You said the who is the why. Okay. Now let's stay with that brother, Paul. Okay. The who is the why. So I think that is fucking awesome. Right. And completely (laughs) right. And completely right. And completely right. And so I, I wrote, I wrote my doctorate at Oxford and I have to atone for too many footnotes, but sometimes fucking awesome is the best description of everything. We don't need any laugh <laughs> because that's fucking awesome, right? Well, let's, let's stay with that, okay? I think you're, ab- you're absolutely right. The who is the why? And that's why when I do the three great questions of cosmorotic humanism, I actually leave the why out because exactly as you said, the who and the where and the what actually self-evidently take care of the why. What happens today in culture is there's this entire argument that happens of theologic, right, and surface and superficial philosophy and absurd intellectual arguments, which actually have no direct access to the lived experience of what reality is on the inside of the inside. So we need to open not just the eye of the mind, which is critical, and the eye of the senses, which is critical. We need to open what I would call the eye of consciousness, which, which has in it the eye of the heart and the eye. And when I say the eye, I mean E-Y-E, the eye of consciousness, which has the eye of the heart and the eye of value and the eye of contemplation, the eye of the spirit, where I have direct access to, and I gather all of my information from the sciences, the interior sciences, from the exterior sciences. I realize, oh, where am I? Cosmorotic universe. Who, who, who means there's an infinite personhood in cosmos. Right. And that infinite person that lives as Paul and holds Paul at the same time. Right. Lives as Paul and holds Paul, right? The infinite personhood. And then what? What's there to do? What what that infinite personhood that lives in me and holds me needs for me in the next moment? Fuck the why. Right. In other words, that's the point. In other words, in other words, we get so lost in the why. All philosophy departments and all theology, right, are arguments, Sunnis and Shades are fighting about the why. Let's actually, if we can actually create a shared language of value in these three great questions of cosmorotic humanism, who, where, who am I, where am I, and what's there to do, then as you say so beautifully, the who is the why, the what is the why, the where is the why. We've gotten caught in the why question, but we don't need it, right? When when you're, and again, if I can, I apologize for using that image again, but when you're in this moment of erotic expansion and you're, you know, nine seconds before, you know, a particular kind of explosion and that erotic encounter with the beloved, you don't say why. Why, 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 why do I exist? It's self-evident because you're with the who. Right? And the what is so clear and where you are is self-evident and obvious. So I'm going to kind of liberate us from the why. As you said, for the precise reason that you said, you just blew it out of the water. And I'm going to quote you. Like, it's a beautiful quote. The who is the why? Well, there, yeah, I, I understand all the things you're saying. But I must say. I'm giving you a hard time. Today, no, no, Paul. I'm having a good time. Um, <laughs> for me. Last time we're going to invite Daphne back. I get that. No, I understand. No, no, no. Not at all. <laughs> um, I don't believe that anything worth living is not worth challenging. So. Uh, no, he, he, you, you just happen to be with a guy that challenges himself a lot to make sure that I'm not falling prey to my own blind spots. But but I'm going to ask you a question. Challenge away, brother. I'll I'll ask you to ask me, and then yes, I'm going to ask you. Why do you care? Right, that's a great. Why that's a great question. do you care? You see, all the intellectual head fucking that goes on in academia takes the question right. like why into the head. But if you ask the question why from your heart, 
Like, why do you care about why? Why do you care about people understanding love so deeply? Why do you care enough to study all those books behind you? Why do you care about taking the time to be on this podcast? That's a why right, so, question. So why? I love it. So, and the answer is who? The answer. Right, so this is how. Ask me that question. I want you to ask me right, why. Right. Why do I care? <laughs> I'm going to ask you, I promise I'm going to, I'm going to promise I'm going to ask you, but before I ask, I'm going to ask you in one second, but I'm going to just respond to it first because you invited me to respond and to ask you. So I'm going to do both because I'm a very obedient podcast, you know, you know, guest. <laughs> so I'm going to do both. Okay. So one is, here's my You're response. Erotic. Not an answer. <laughs> Right, right, right. So, so certain questions have answers. You can't answer the question, but I can respond to the question. Why do I care? I care because of you, because I can feel you and my encounter with you, with the you-ness, with the irreducible value and beauty and goodness of Paulness evokes in me a radical caring, a radical delight. Right, it opens me up. I feel desire to know you. I feel devotion to you. I, I feel the desire to bracket my egoic self in order to know and embrace you more. And so, why I care is because I've had a direct encounter with who. Now, let me ask you. So let me just breathe for a second. Let's breathe. Breath. So that's why I care. That, that's at least at least enough of a response for now. So now we need a drum roll. Hold on, drum roll. Your drum roll. Paul, why do you care? Because I love. Right. And everything that you just said is a description of love in action. Yes, sir. And that's that's the why. Why? Because I care. Why? Because I love. The why is the love in action. It's why we do the things. It's why morality is so important. It's why relationship is so important. And if we don't know why, then we don't know why we must be conscious of the obligation that comes with love. P3OM by Bioptimizers is hands down one of the most important supplements to have on you everywhere you go. If you're traveling, if you go to work, if you're going to friend's house to eat, this product will knock out food poisoning and almost any kind of gut disorder from viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever could irritate your gut so quickly. It's mind-blowing. I have been using this product since Wade Lightheart first turned me on to it, and he's the formulator of it. And I've got Wade here to tell us how it works, but I just want you to hear it from me. I have all my clients use this. I try to get it to friends, to family members, because it is really like your own bodyguard. So Wade, how in the world does this thing work so well every time? Well, as you know, we're very research oriented and we have literally a university in Croatia that we do microbiome testing with our labs of PhDs to find out what's the most effective formulation. And we are quickly moving into the post-antibiotic world where we need to cultivate super probiotics. We all heard of super bad bacteria in hospitals and stuff that are antibiotic resistance. But what we did, we worked with a medical doctor that was able to take an aggressive strain of L. plantarum, which is a very aggressive strain, and then put it through almost like a BUDS camp, a Navy SEALs training where we subjected this particular probiotic to a toxic environment. We ran a sine wave through it. And out of that survived only about somewhere between two and 3%. We then take that and grow it on very special food. We feed them just like you would feed a great athlete. You feed them special food and the probiotics develop unique capabilities. We have a US patent that is so powerful. I can't read it on the airwaves because we'd get canceled. But what I can say is when you put P3OM in your body, it goes out and breaks down any undigested protein, whether it's in your gut or through your blood system. And it becomes your Navy SEALs defense force, if you will, to go out and wipe out whatever pathogen might come in your body. You just need more of these guys to overwhelm it. It takes it out. It cleans up any messes. And for the last 18 years, I've been using P3OM daily. And I can honestly say, I've never been sick during that time. If I feel something coming on, I just double down my dosage, take four caps every night. If I get a little, if I'm traveling, I take twice that. 
And it's been great. A lot of our people do it. And it's one of our best selling products. And it's available to your audience. Just go to p3om.com slash living 40. Put in Paul 10, get a 10% discount. And if it's not the best probiotic you've ever had in your life, you get 100% of your money back. That's from us at Bioptimizers. That's our guarantee for you. Go get it. It's for real. I love the stuff. Thank you, Wade. Just one, one thing. One, will you marry me? And of Shannon, course, okay. I'm already, I, I was <laughs> married to you from the beginning. There we go. Okay, so we're in. Okay. We had to do so this so two. we could enjoy each other, which is exactly that's, why God does this right? game. And that's why it's so important. Remember, the why is the who. <laughs> Why is the who? The why is the who? The why is the who? So, and, and that's another, by the way, great title for the podcast. The why is the who, right? I mean, in other words, right, right. The answer to the why question, the why is the who is, is so deep and so real. But you said something else that we have to pick up on, which is so, you know, subtle and you slipped it in there. And I want to actually highlight it and, and, and speak into it because it's so important and so compelling. So you talked about, you introduced the word obligation. It's a great word. And, you know, I talk a lot about obligation in, in the unique self work. You read, I believe, self, or I listened to the, the self audio book. We're actually about to put the unique self audio book, you know, up online. My friend Terry Nelson actually is recording it for us, which is very beautiful of him. And one of the things we talk there is about obligation. And you can't talk about love without talking about obligation. There is no love without obligation. And love itself creates obligation. Now, we... We're, you know, you know, my friend, John, John Mackey, um, invited me to speak at a conference at Esalen, some think tank conference like five, six years ago or seven years ago, whenever it was. And I gave the opening talk it was one of those kind of 20 people conferences. And there's only 25 people there. And I start and say, you know, that, that there's an, an obligation and I start talking about obligation and John, who's, who's not at all shy and a beautiful man says, stop, no obligation. I don't want to talk about obligation. <laughs> obligation is right. He's, he objected to the word because of course, and what he was objecting to, and I understand where he was coming from someplace very deep, which is he understood obligation intuitively as something externally imposed, right? By some alienated construct, which makes a, a violating demand on you. But actually, and here, let's go to the original Hebrew. But to the original Hebrew, the word love and obligation are the same word. When you said that in the self book, I love that. And, and, and in right? fact, I must credit you, you know, though I had always known love was obligation, when, when I was listening to you talk about that, it reminded me of how important that is to remind people of, because I think that's one of the things more today probably than in a long time that causes intimate committed relationships and marriages to fall apart because people get married when they're sex high and puppy love and they don't realize that to mature through the stages of love which you could say are are, are parallel to or congruent with the stages of consciousness you have to have obligation you're absolutely right in other words there's no love without obligation, but, but again, not because we need to take on this heavy, you know, alienated responsibility because without obligation, there's no love. No, no, not that. No, no. Love is obligation. In other words, and let me say it a different way. Let me open up a different door and we'll come back to love obligation with your permission, brother. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm digging the ride, you know, let's ride. It's crazy beautiful. So desire is devotion. That's, that's a good way to access it. Let's go to desire and devotion, then back to love obligation. So when you are, and again, and the reason I sometimes use images of the sexual, because the sexual models eros. It's why the Song of Solomon is the most important book in the Hebrew canon. So when a person is sexually involved, right, they have to be radically devoted. You can't pleasure a man or pleasure a woman without being madly devoted. If you're not experiencing devotion, you're like, what am I doing? Hello? Right, really? So if you look on the outside and you remove the experience of desire, you remove the experience of desire that arouses devotion, you don't even understand what you're doing. But when you're actually in the fullness of clarified desire, not desire which is 
an aggressive kind of violence, which is a pseudo eros. There's desire, which is pseudo eros. Yeah, it's not a. It's not a neediness. It, it. Well, it's not. It's not a superficial need. It's not. It's need. It's need, but not neediness. That's my it's a point. Whole need. Right. It's. It's. You see, love is desire and obligation, and even eros. If, if I would use my own way of relating to it, is when 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 love is neediness, then it becomes um, entangled. It becomes challenging. It becomes. It, it does. Um, it it does. can cause fractures. No good. Let's hold that. So, so but you just said something so important. Let's see if we can, if we can, you know, and we we can disambiguate these three strands, and then bring them together. So we've got love needs versus neediness. Paul puts on the table. We've got love and obligation. We've got desire and devotion. So let's play with them together. Let's first do desire and devotion. So you are madly in desire and notice that your desire arouses devotion. That's a wild realization. When we, we actually have this, this denigration of desire, desire is said both in the East and in the West, desire is counterposed to divinity. You're lost in desire. Right. You, you, desire is viewed in some sense as the opposite of the sacred. That's precisely wrong. In totally. Words, that's what, to, right. Reality is eros, right? One of the four faces of eros is desire and desire arouses devotion. So the more I desire you, if I'm actually in the clarified desire, the more I'm devoted to you. And, and we've, we've exiled devotion to the doddering, non-desiring, you know, spouse, right? Who we say, oh, at least they're devoted. Fuck that. That's completely wrong. And that's right. Desire and devotion are intimately connected. I want to serve my queen. I want to serve my king. Right. I'm in devotion. Now, once and not I, just serve, but to fulfill. And, right. And serve a gorgeous, right? Gorgeous. Not to serve in the sense of like, no, actually, I want to bracket. Desire means I'm willing to bracket my ego. I'm willing to bracket my need for fulfillment for a moment to be in radical devotion to your own fullest realization. And that's what yeah. love is. Love is the capacity to bracket the self in full and mad devotion to the gorgeous fulfillment of the other's unique self. That's what love is. Love's the capacity to bracket the self and allow the desire, which then births devotion for the most radical fulfillment of the eros of my beloved. Wow. Wow. It's like, it's like, wow. So that leads us to love and obligation. So when I experience that devotion, I don't experience that as an option. I could, I couldn't, maybe, maybe not. Oh my God, no. No, I, I feel radically called in terms of this interior sense of gorgeous obligation, right? I feel complete. There's no choice. I, I'm in complete choicelessness, as Krishnamurti called it, right? I'm utterly obligated to you, but not because a government told me, right? and not because some exterior law book told me, but rather I am the unique expression of love intelligence, and I'm the only person who can serve you and be devoted to you in this particular way, in this particular time, and that obligates me. So that's gorgeous. I want to add a dimension to it, if I could. Sure. No. You go back to the Holy Trinity model, zero neutral, unconditional on the yes. left, if you like, zero negative, Shakti, the womb, the implicate, desire. On the right, the masculine expression, zero positive, Shiva, will. Desire and will create each other. To the degree one desires, they will. The obligation of love's desire is the will to fulfill, the will to participate, the gorgeous. will to relate, the will to engage. That's gorgeous. That that's really really beautiful. And let's let's come back to an. I'm gonna I'm gonna bracket a conversation, which is a different conversation we need to have about masculine and feminine. And I actually have a. I'm a little bit, and I mean this. And, and I apologize to anyone listening. I mean this just as a kind of overflow of holy confusion. I'm, I'm trying to get lots of writings out these days. And so one of them is this book um, called Beyond He and She on unique gender and on, you know, this deeper vision of the masculine and feminine, which is a response to the transgender conversation. 
you know, and I call it from transgender to unique gender. And it's about what I call lines and circles. So we have to have that masculine feminine conversation. That's I'm, I'm going to take that conversation for a second. Well, let me just let me let, before you go off, I want to make sure you understand how I'm using the term. The right. zero, zero negative is the womb of creation. It's the emptiness that makes space for form. It's the formless be, that gives room for form. So I'm using the feminine. I'm using I'm I'm using the feminine expression as that which makes room for the expression of the divine womb of the emptiness or the realm of the implicate in which you can't weigh or measure anything but the entelechy is existing in that domain and it infuses itself into form be it Beautiful. human otherwise or even the tree or the rock so the masculine is that which is expressed because it is an expression, it's positive. You know, Alan Watts does this interesting little exercise because people keep arguing over what defines yin versus yang. So you, you may have heard this one before, but I've Please. studied Alan Watts's collected work several times. He says, here's an example. You got a blackboard. I walk up to it and I put a white dot on it. And I ask the audience, is that white dot positive yang masculine or is it yin feminine and he gets people that will go both ways and then he says okay now i've got a whiteboard i put the black dot on it is it masculine projected or feminine so the point he's making is it doesn't matter which way you go the board is the receptive and the dot is the expressive so if you think the black dot's yin because it's black that's fine then you have to just keep it straight in your head but the 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 key thing here is that the the blackboard in my metaphor is the emptiness that makes room for whatever you want to put on it and what you put on it is a projection it's now something on the board that's how i'm using these i mean we're in all this crazy bullshit with masculine and feminine but i'm like getting down to the most essential basics well, that that that's very beautiful and what we absolutely share and and again you know, one of our challenges is, is that every one of these paragraphs, we could go all the way in on. So, right. So I, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens when, whenever we get together. It's like, OK, so much for the outline. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need a separate, a separate dialogue on, on, on masculine and feminine. We absolutely share. And, and it's, you know, just very beautiful. If I can just summarize what you said before we get to love and neediness, which is where we were going, which is that when. There's something underneath the cultural categories of gender, which are called masculine and feminine, which are primal forces of reality. Exactly. Which go all the way down. Right? And that's what we completely share. I call those lines and circles. I love that definition too. Lines and circles. And I'm, I'm borrowing that from the 16th century, the interior sciences of the 16th century, which talk about igulim, circles, and yosher lines. and you know, there's about 10 qualities of line and there's about 10 qualities of circle and they go all the way down and this emptiness, right? And this, you know, projection of the emptiness is, is one of the ways to talk about it. So let's commit to at the right time and right place, we'll have this full dialogue on, you know, these line and circle or these masculine and feminine qualities and, and why they're so important because we actually have to move, you know, let me say it this way transgender asked the right question, which was what transgender said was, you know, underneath, you know, cultural categories of boy and girl, there's something deeper that I am. I'm not just boy. I'm not just girl. That's actually correct. I'm not just boy. I'm not just girl. There's something deeper. I'm unique self. I'm true self. And we have to have a dialogue on self, but there's much deeper understandings of self that are way deeper than gender. But they got the answer wrong. They said, okay, when I'm more than boy or girl, so they basically killed the category of gender. And then they said, identity is purely fluid. There's no deeper ground of identity than your boy and girl, right? And, and, and whatever fluid combination of balance between boy and girl you decided on, that's actually incorrect. Actually, it's not that I'm a fluid boy and girl. Actually, I'm grounded in either boy or girl but I've got girl and my boy and boy and my girl. And there's qualities of boy and girl 
which are deep in cosmos. I call those lines and circles. We have line qualities and circle qualities, which show up in the masculine and feminine. What I actually am is I'm a unique synergized combination of lines and circles that make up my unique gender. So unique gender is not transgender, it's much deeper and it's not balance. I was talking to my friend, John Gray, and John, John too is fantastic. You know, John says, well, let, you mean balance between masculine and feminine? I said, no, not balance. Not balance. It's a unique synergized integration, right, of masculine and feminine, just something new, which is a unique gender. So Paul Check is not, oh, just the balance between his line and circle qualities, right? No, Paul Check is a unique synergized integration of line and circle, which is unique gender, right, called Paul. And so we need to have that, that conversation because we actually need a new language of gender because the transgender community is actually saying important things. They're asking important questions, but there's no categories. There's no deep dharma that allows for a response. The response becomes completely surface with tragedies. You have girls all over the country who are cutting off their breasts before they're actually at an age where they can actually make that decision, right? And boys all over the country who are getting you know, surgeries, right? Some of which can't be reversed at an age where they don't actually have the depth and gravitas to make those decisions. They haven't even formed an ego yet. How do you, how do you even have a sense of yourself without a locus of consciousness in which you can reach the point of recognizing your own viewpoints, your own values, and your own judgments, right? That's right. No, that, no, that's exactly right, Paul. And you're in rebellion. So 50 years ago when you were in a rebellion, so let's say you were rebelling 50 years ago, you rebelled against your religion because that's what you rebelled against. But now religion's kind of not even interesting to rebel against anymore. Then you rebelled against your country. You know, you rebelled against the United States, right? You became, you know, 60s, right? America, you will burn the flag. But that's not interesting to rebel against anymore. So the only thing people have left to rebel against, meaning the only dimension of identity that actually remains for an adolescent is boy, girl. So your adolescent rebellion is no longer fueled at your religion. It's no longer fueled towards your nationality. The only place to fuel it is boy, girl. But actually, it's not actually a deep understanding of who you are. It's actually adolescent rebellion. And if you allow adolescent rebellion to make irreversible body decisions, right, you're actually violating right, our core educational right, responsibility right, to the next generation. So we actually need a deeper and wider language of gender, which honors the transgender question, but actually approaches it more, you know, much deeper. But let's go back to where we were, because you said something about need and neediness. But I want to, I want to, I want to say something while it's, while it's appropriate right there. Go, 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 brother. I'm a parent and wow. a grandparent. I have a 43-year-old. I have a grandchild. I have a seven-year-old boy. I have a three-and-a-half-year-old, almost four-year-old daughter. Amen. I know all about childhood rebellion. Yeah. But it's the job of a parent to create a container so that the rebellion does not become destructive to the child or anybody else. And what we're dealing with right now is the complete and utter abolishment of the responsibility of parenthood in which the child is be given the rights to rebel and make the parents conform when the parent's job is to be a container because the parent is supposed to have developed a rational faculty. And when rebellion is unrational and it can't be grounded in the rational, it becomes very dangerous. And the problem is the children become the losers. And now the parents have to sit back and go, what did I do? When I didn't do. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. When I say gorgeous, I mean, and it's, it's true. Right? Yeah. You know, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. So by gorgeous, I mean a deep truth you spoke and, and hallelujah. And, and let's even just double click on it because clearly you're not going to let me get to love and neediness. So let's, let's double click. No, I'll let you it. get there. But I, you know, as a parent and, and seeing all this go on, I've got to say, you know, the deeper problem is we 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 have parents that haven't become adults yet, and they're acting like children with children. Beautiful, brother. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to be able to share this podcast with you, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about one of my secret methods for keeping me vital and strong, and that's Organifi's Balanced Probiotic Formula in Capsules. Organifi Balanced Capsules gives your gut system the support it needs to help you feel better in many ways. 
I suspect by now you've seen one of the many excellent documentaries showing how essential the health of our microbiome is and how consuming the right probiotic bacteria can really help your body, emotions, and mind in many ways. Each dose of Organifi Balance capsules includes five of the most important probiotic bacteria for a healthy body, and Organifi guarantees 20 billion colony-forming units of probiotic bacteria per serving, which ensures that a significant amount of health-giving bacteria will make it through your stomach into your small intestine and colon where they can do their magic. Organifi's Balance formula supports GI health, supports you in having a healthy digestive system, probiotic replenishment, promotes gut flora diversity, supports healthy gut flora, maintains healthy gut balance, reduces bloating and gas and supports you in having regular bowel movements, which improves detoxification, helps you reduce or eliminate abdominal discomfort, improves digestion and absorption, supports your immune system and gives it the boost you need for a healthy immune response. To get your 20% L4D discount on Organifi Balance Formula and Capsules and support your health and vitality each day, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash check 20. That's Organifi dot com forward slash check 20. For your Living 4D discount on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. As an added bonus, you can use your Check 20 discount code on all purchases and subscriptions and get 20% off. Feel free to visit the website for more technical information on the ingredients in Organifi Balance. Enjoy. Let's expand what you said because it, it's so heartrending, and so we have such a massive responsibility here, right? It, it's it's not just that the parent has to, as you say so properly, develop a rational faculty. The parent has to be a transmitter of a field of wisdom, yes, of a field of value, yes. Right? The parents' experiences themselves in the Tao, right? Meaning in the field of value right, in the field of wisdom, then the parent transmits that wisdom to the next generation. And the fundamental, the educational function that allows society is the transmission of value and wisdom from generation to generation. What we've done is, and when I talk about existential risk, which, you know, in other contexts as the potential death of our humanity, there's two kinds of existential risk, the death of humanity, an extinction event, or the death of our humanity, one of the ways that we move towards the death of our humanity is we interrupt the generational process of the transmission of wisdom. Totally. Essentially, what, what's happening today is things like TikTok and WeChat, right? Those, those seemingly innocuous social media structures are actually interrupting the core process of the transmission of wisdom from one generation to another. And so if the parent, and now, and the reason the parent is lost is, is because the parent actually experiences themselves as being outside the field of value, either because they can't access the field or they've been told there is no field of value. So if you're a parent today and you actually are educated on an implicit postmodern context in which there is no field of value, in which there is no Tao, there is no evolving eternal wisdom. So then how do you have the ground from which to transmit that wisdom to your child? And what your child most desperately needs from you is the ability to locate themselves in the field of value and the field of wisdom. And I want to just maybe add one sentence, Paul. It's not about values. It's about value. See, we have this argument about values. No, it's not about values. It's about value. It's that we're in the field of value. Once we're in the field of value, we can argue about different values, and that's a beautiful, fruitful argument because we're in the field of value, right? But the issue is not what, what we do today is we do, we actually pick a value. We say, oh, that's our value, you know, life, choice, whatever it is, but we're not actually really in the field of value. Once we're in the field of value together, then we, there's many, many different unique intimacies and many unique instruments and an enormous amount of diversity. But parents today cannot be parents. We've actually deconstructed, right, the potential of a parent to potentiate the next generation, which is the death of our humanity. So we need to literally reclaim parenthood. We need to reclaim parenthood. Like, wow. You see, value to me is also a field of intimacy because in order for something to be 
of value. It has to be experienced within yourself, right? I, I, in order, if, if we're having a topic about the value of anything, I have to use my feeling function of consciousness in order to experience what it is that we're talking about, right? Otherwise, it just becomes words against words, which is part of the problem we have today. So for me, value is really inherent quality of love and intimacy, because without love and intimacy, you have no way to measure value subjectively. So, so that, beautiful. That's gorgeous. Let's, let's, let's work with that together, brother, okay? So the field of value is the field of intimacy. Right, right. There's a, you know, I, I, I have every generation needs to actually articulate its name of God because the name of God is the kind of the basic monadic structure of reality. In every great tradition, there's the name of God is everything. Name of, the name of God is the DNA, if you will, if I can borrow that term of reality. So the name of God I work with, uh, she kind of whispered in my ear one day, is God is the infinite intimate, or goddess is the infinite intimate, or God is the infinity of intimacy. So there's a field of intimacy, and the field of intimacy is the field of value, right? So I both, I both experience the value in my own anthro-ontological consciousness, anthro-human, ontological, for real, right? In my own intimate whispering, I actually have a direct experience of value. So in other words, I am value personified. I'm intimate with value because there's no split between value and I. I am value. And value is real. So it's not just that, but it's not just I'm value in, in a subjective sense. You know, however I feel on a, on a particular day. You know, I've got to clarify my feeling function. I've got to clarify my intimacy in order to get access to the field of value. And I participate in a larger field of value. And, and that's why we can have a conversation. The, the reason you and I can talk to each other is because value is not just what we're making up. We're, we're in a field of value together. Now then... Paul will be a unique expression of value. He'll have a unique contribution, a unique clarification of value. But we both can look at each other and say beauty, and we can know what we're talking about. We can say good, and, and we don't experience that, oh, this is Mark's goodness, this is Paul's goodness. We're both actually accessing this field of goodness, but it's not just a platonic form, although it starts there. It's not just the, the, the abstract goodness. It's a living, throbbing goodness, and it's an evolving goodness. It's evolving and it evolves through Paul and it evolves through Mark. If a parent doesn't locate themselves and in that field of value and they can't act, they don't trust the mysteries that live within them and they can't locate those mysteries in the larger fields of mystery, they can't actually be a parent. They can't actually transmit to the next generation. They have then, nothing. They have no foundation. Right. And so we need literally, I mean, I mean. I, we kind of fell into this topic, but it's it's so wildly important because the, the the sacred obligation of the parent is the transmission of value. That that's that, that's what the parent needs to do, and it's more you know when my my son Zion, you know he comes and we'll spend a you know a full Saturday together, right, or a full Sunday, and we'll spend it in. We do two things: we watch videos. That actually, my friend, um, I haven't seen him in many years. We did a, a couple of um, radio interviews back in the day and a, a couple of public debates. Dennis Prager, who's a kind of arch conservative. I disagree with Dennis about 90% of things, but he does, <laughs> he does very good videos on value that kind of counter the kind of woke curriculum. And now the woke curriculum also has some importance and some dignity, and, and Dennis doesn't understand that. But since my son is deeply exposed to woke, right, I need him to actually get direct access to value. So we sit all day and we go between watching Supergirl. He loves Supergirl, right? And I don't know what that is, but Supergirl's the Supergirl's like a Netflix, you know, Supergirl, right? So there's like a thousand, you know, so we watch Supergirl and we analyze the values at play because heroes often incarnate values. So one of the ways I try and teach my son values is we'll watch hero movies. Right. Well, watching the, uh, the entire genre of heroes is one of the few places in public culture that public culture is trying to grapple with value. So what I'll do with my son is we'll watch any kind of hero movie, whether it's Marvel or Superman or Supergirl or it doesn't matter what it is, because the conversation is about values here. The, the, the place of the hero is the place where cultures have is grappling with value. So I'll do my friend Dennis Prager's value, you know, kind of videos and I'll do superhero you know, Netflix, 
and we'll spend like 12 hours just talking about value. Because right? if I have 12 hours with them, and we, we, of course, we laugh and we, you know, we play, but, but it's all about the most important thing I can do is, can I transmit value to him so that he locates himself in the field of value? And when you can't do that, then your child rebels and they say, well, I'm not really a boy. I'm not really a girl. The parent has no sense of, of anything. They, they, they were, well, what is gender and how does it work? And they don't have a deep, deeper field of the masculine, a deeper field of the feminine. They don't know what it is. They're, they're not getting education from any place. They're not, there's no training, right? There's no, and, and so culture literally collapses at its center. And that's actually what's happening. And then the World Economic Forum steps in. Right, right, and then techno feudalism steps in, right, and then all forms of technocracy steps in because the center is not holding anymore. And what you and I are trying to do in different ways, brother, is we're trying to reweave the center so that the center will hold by reweaving together from our different perspectives the field of value. And even though we, we might express things differently, and 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 we might, you know, have even even maps that sometimes even you know counterpose each other, it doesn't matter because. We're in the field of value together. And so what's going to happen is when we talk to each other, we're going to synergize because we're not in an ego clash. I'm not holding on to a value for identity. No, I'm in the field of value and I feel you in the field of value. And so I want to hear everything you have to say because I want to know, wow, what's not what's wrong about that, which is an egoic debate. What's right about that? What can I take in? What can I swallow whole? What, what, what can Paul say that will change me, that will move me, that will shift me, that will clarify me? I mean, oh my God. And that's what it means to love. Well, to me too, uh, if I could share on that, without a, a because in my new book series, uh, Spirit Gym, I, I have Spirit Gym. That's awesome! What a great name. Yeah, it's called Welcome to Spirit Gym: Your Guide to More Love, Life, and Freedom, and it's a six-volume set. I'm gonna, uh, you know, part of me wants to give a, a sort of a, a, a foundational response, but but I'm gonna make it simple so that we can talk about lots of other things without getting sidetracked on one thing that could be a huge topic. It's like need and needing. It's just saying, go ahead. <laughs> well, well, you see, if we go from right or wrong and we say, if God is unconditional love, then everything's a unique expression of, of unconditional love. And so what I love about you and about Ken Wilber and about all the great people I study from Steiner to Yogananda to Baum to you name it. I mean, there's a lot of them that I've studied is that like when I'm with you, Mark, I'm getting a chance to see what it looks like for God to be expressed and see and feel and experience the world through that expression of divinity. So for me, it's not you know yeah you you and I can debate and and define but what I like when I listen to your audio books or when I when I'm talking to you I'm like god damn it's so fucking interesting to see what god looks like from that perspective and and so even if I like penny penny has walked in when I'm watching these crazy ass dogmatic christian videos and and God will burn you in hell and all this shit. And she looks at me. She's like, Paul, why do you watch that stuff? And I say, honey, as a therapist, I have to understand how people see life in order for me to really help people that get lost in a mindset or a belief system. I've got to be, I can't just say you're wrong. I have to go into it with them. And say, what is it like to be God expressed in this way? And so I find you so fascinating because I get to see what God looks like when God takes love seriously, takes value seriously, takes commitment seriously, and devotes itself to the work of love that allows the rest of us to grow our sense of awareness, which we couldn't have done if you hadn't done what you've done through your own commitment. So I, I may have different viewpoints than you, but what I'm doing here as a human being is going, Jesus, that's an amazing way to look at it. Or, wow, that's an interesting way to, to, to perceive. And, and, and to the degree that I say, wow, that feeds me, I love it. And to the degree that it doesn't, I say, that's interesting. That's Mark's gym. Mark's got that special piece of equipment in there. He, he 
resists uh, this notion. So that's that's great because he's growing that way, right? In other words, if I'm talking to a dogmatic Christian or even a person who thinks they should let their kids make decisions, my first thought is, okay, that's your spirit, Jim. That's what you've set up for your field of resistance. And yes, you're taking your child in it. They're your child. They're on the journey with you. I can support you, but I also have to ask, how's that working for you? Right. And and the distinction you make is so beautiful. I mean, first of all, that was an incredibly beautiful set of sentences. So thank you. Right. And, and it's exciting to get to say thank you and just to enjoy and feel the delight of those sentences. Well, thank you. I mean, this is a, this is honestly, you, you give me a lot, um, a hell of a lot. Like there's a lot of God coming through you. And, and when you see and feel that in somebody, you, you realize that the, they've pierced the veil. So the light's coming out. And for me, I can feel the love. Like I can debate someone as hotly as hell if I feel the love coming out, because then I don't feel like I'm being diminished or threatened or denied. I feel like I'm being exposed to another facet of the diamond. And, and so the debate's really about, let me show you what's in this diamond. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. No, no. And it's and said so beautifully because really when we're, when we're on the inside of the inside, when we're in the field of value, then we actually are nourished. We're fed. And actually, if we can kind of just allow ourselves, right, to open up, right, then we can actually create enormous, enormous depth and beauty, which can often be paradoxical, right? We can actually have two counterposed notions, but we move from polarization to paradox. In other words, polarization happens when two people are debating, but they're not in the field of value. And since they're not in the field of value, what they do is they choose one value, they make it their idolatrous identity, and of course, no one's ever willing to compromise in their identity because they feel they'll die, and so therefore, they've got to fight to the death. That's called polarization. So the American conversation is taking place outside the field of value. So even in something like abortion, brother where you would say, well, you've got this pro-choice and pro-life debate, but it's, of course, an absurd debate because what does it mean to be pro-life? You're pro-life, you're against choice. Choice is also a value. And what does it mean to be pro-choice? You're against life. Life is also a value. But actually, both the pro-life people and the pro-choice people have taken themselves out of the field of value. The pro-choice people are generally liberal postmodern. So they're deconstructed the field of value. So they've picked only one value. They were outside the field of value. There's only one value. That value is absolute choice. The pro-life people are also outside of the field of value because they're saying, no, only our fundamentalist Christian right viewpoint is correct. That's a dogmatic position, which is not in the field of value. So both the liberal postmodern proponents of the radical choice positions and the radical life positions, which are the dogmatic closed Christian fundamentalisms, both of them paradoxically are not in the field of value. So therefore what you do is when you're not in the field of value, then what happens is you can never have too much of your own value because your value becomes your idolatry. So I'm pro-choice. I'm pro-choice. I can never have too much choice. And then death is compromised. I can never have too much life and death is compromised. So you get polarization. Now, if I'm in the field of value, then of course, let's say I'm death. I'm, excuse me, let's say I'm life and your choice. So we look at each other and we say, oh, we're both discrete expressions, unique expressions of the field, but we're both in the field. So if you're saying life and I'm saying choice, but we're both in the field of value, we both recognize and feel and are allured to each other because we're both expressing the potency and aliveness of the field of value. But if we're outside the field of value and I say life and you say choice, we kill each other and polarize because we don't recognize each other in the field of value. And that's the source of polarization in America today. It's actually shocking. And when you see the discussion of polarization, it completely misses the point. It does. And the problem is, is the battle over abortion leads to abortion of each other. 
The battle over abortion leads to abortion of each other. And if we could only locate ourselves in the field of value, we'd actually realize that actually there's a synergy, that actually the extremist position, you know, you know, you know, extremists, you know, Paul, extremists feel better when they wake up in the morning, at least at first blush, and then they feel bad later, but they feel better because it's all clear. It's all clear. It's all right. Nothing to, nothing to work out. It's all clear, right? But they have a kind of pre-tragic clarity. Pre-tragic experience is always complete, complete clarity. You've got to be willing to let go of the clarity, move beyond the pre-tragic, enter in the tragic, which is it's complete unclear, swim in the complexity, and then you get to the post-tragic, right? When you're actually able to synergize, right, the complexity and get to a new second simplicity, which always embraces a synergy of values. So the move from polarization to paradox is the move from the tragic to the post-tragic, right? And you remember, you remember um, Yeats, right? When he talks about, he says, and this is my favorite description of the post-tragic, right? There's always pre-tragic. Pre-tragic means totally clear, complete clarity. So complete clarity means you're completely clear about your position, whether it's pro-choice, pro-life, wh whatever it is and any issue, right? Pre-tragic. Tragic means you've been willing to abandon your clarity. You're willing to be in the tragedy of unclarity. You're willing to be in the uncertainty. And then you stay there. You work with it. You get to the post-tragic, which is this new second simplicity, but it's not, it's not a dogmatic clarity. It's the clarity of action that comes from synergizing opposing values. When that happens, so Yates says it like this. He says, how does it go? He says, when such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness fills my breast. We can dance and we can sing. We are blessed by everything and everything we look upon is blessed. Yeah. That's post-tragic, not pre-tragic. It's not fundamentalism. It's not postmodern fundamentalism. It's not Christian religious fundamentalism. It's no, I cast out remorse. I've, I've, been in, I've been in the tragic. I've wrestled with the complexity. We're in the field of value together. We can talk to each other. We can see each other face to face. We can feel that we can feel value alive in each other. And then from there, we get to the post tragic and everything we look upon is blessed. And, and that's what we need to do again. We need to find each other face to face in the field of value. A parent and a child need to meet each other in the field of value. That's that's the inheritance I give to my child. Nothing else matters. Yeah, I, I agree. Hi, everybody. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Did you know that statistics show that only 8% of men and 3% of women do any regularly scheduled exercise, including walking a dog? If COVID taught us anything, it was that now it's more important to be healthy and fit than ever before. Are you ready to create the body you want, get fit, be healthy, love what you see in the mirror, wear the clothes you've always wanted to, and have the confidence that you can do it efficiently and effectively? How about having beautiful abs and a lovely butt too? If your answer to these questions is yes, then stick with me for the next couple of minutes and I'll tell you exactly how you can do it. I'll tell you exactly how I do it. I was shocked while doing research for course development when I came across a study showing that the average person today only knows 8 to 12 exercises. I was just as shocked when I found a completely independent study showing that the average person today only eats 10 to 12 foods, and that's it. They just live off 10 to 12 foods, often don't look or feel well, but don't know why. That's pretty sad when you consider that there are about 350,000 edible plants and a fantastic variety of flesh foods we can eat to ensure adequate nutrient variety to keep ourselves healthy. Many people know they need exercise but feel insecure about going to a gym because they aren't sure what to do there and a lot of people that could afford a gym membership can't afford a personal trainer and that sadly may be a good thing. Why? Because a significant percentage of personal trainers got their certificate by doing nothing but reading a book and passing a multiple choice test online. There's no specific technical training on many of the most important aspects of technique or the science of exercise. Rarely is there any mention of the importance of diet and lifestyle factors that are integral to any effective conditioning program. This would be like studying to be a medical doctor and only studying the bones and not knowing anything about how the rest of the systems of the body work or how they work together. 
My dream when I developed Integrated Movement Science Level 1 was to create a truly functional holistic training program that anyone, not just exercise and health professionals, could study, apply, and get fantastic results with. My Integrated Movement Science program not only gives you the essential training on key self-assessments and how to correct any imbalances identified, you learn how to do all the most important functional exercises we can do in a gym with correct form. You also learn the essentials of how to design an exercise program effectively so that you get the results you want, including how to progress each exercise and your exercise program in carefully planned stages so you get healthier, stronger, and fitter without getting injured. The Czech Institute put Integrated Movement Science 1 online so that you can study and practice at your own pace. Any teenager, athlete, or adult can understand what I share and apply it, and it won't be long at all before your friends and all the personal trainers at the gym notice that what you're doing really works and start asking you questions about how you're getting such good results. In fact, you may love the experience so much you decide it's time to change career and become a Czech professional because it feels so good to help others. To help you look and feel your best between now and July 1st, 2023, I'm offering Living 4D listeners a discount of $125 on my Integrated Movement Science course online. That's IMS1 online. To get your discount and start creating a new, healthier, fitter, sexier you, go to chek.group, G-R-O-U-P, forward slash L number 4 D. IMS1. That's check.group forward slash L4D IMS1. This is not case sensitive, so it will work with either upper or lower case. You will get your $125 discount by using the discount code L number 4D IMS1. That's L number 4D IMS and the number 1. Again, it's not case sensitive. Remember, my special offer ends on July 1st, 2023. Now is your chance to be the change and enjoy showing everyone the new you. I'd love to see what you create. Enjoy your journey. Two comments pop up. One, Osho said, unless you can handle a paradox, you will never understand God. Gorgeous. And I, I think that's a true statement. Yeah. The other beautiful. issue is whether it be uh, issues of gender, transhumanism, and many of these other things that can be polarized with Christian dogma versus liberal dogma. It, it boils down to a conflict of belief systems in most cases. Wouldn't you agree? A- absolutely. And belief is the single most damaging structure. And that's my point I want to make right now. Beliefs are permission to stop asking questions. Gorgeous. Jung warned warned that that people adopt belief systems because it allows them to stay unconscious and avoid the real work of honest thinking. Honest thinking and feeling, yes, that's when you have a belief, if, if you believe God will burn you in hell, I got news for you. When you have an out-of-body afterlife experience or even a deep experience on ayahuasca, you are going to be scared to fucking death. Okay? And I, as a shaman, practitioner, and a man who's worked with many people trapped in the middle between life and death, can't tell you how many times I've found people or gone to help people that I know that died and they would not transition because they would not enter the light because their fear of punishment and purgatory was so strong that they had come to be afraid of the very God that they are. And that's the danger of a belief. So yep. when, we, when, we, when we wake up and become adult about all this stuff, instead of hashing and trashing each other, we'll sit at a table together and say, let's challenge our own beliefs together and find out what holds it all together so that we can even sit here and have this discussion. Let's enter the field of value and create a shared grammar of value. That's gorgeous, Paul. But I want to go back to what you said about beliefs because it was so, so important, right? And belief is, is as you, you unpacked it so elegantly, belief is the single most damaging construct because a belief, a belief actually, a belief stands against knowing. And and I want to play with you just for a second, if I can, and introduce just two words. One is what's usually the word for belief. The belief stems 
from a Hebrew word. It's related to the word faith. Faith and belief are completely related. And the word in Hebrew is emuna, which is actually the source word for amen in English. Amen. Oh. Right? It's emuna. Now, emuna is translated, and emuna means your belief. It's translated as your belief, but it doesn't mean belief. It's a mistranslation. Emuna actually means four things. And the word amen, right? Amen means four things. It means trust, not belief. Trust. Right. Trust means trust is the experience that a baby has held in the arms of the mother, right? That her mother won't drop her. Right. That's what trust means. It's not a belief, it's a lived knowing, which is why the second meaning in Hebrew, these are the four Hebrew meanings, right, of the word amen or emunah, which is mistranslated as belief. It's trust. The second word is omen, which means the nursing mother, right? Mm. The word amen means trust and the nursing mother. The third meaning is art, right? And oh, I love it. Is an artist. So it's, it's the art, right? right? It's the art of knowing, right? It's, it's the art of actually experiencing it. And to be alive is to be an artist. And to be an artist means... Right, to be able to create the field from the raw materials of your life that allow you right, to know that you're welcome in the universe, that you're in the arms of the nursing mother and that you can trust the universe. And from that place of trust, you can create. Now to do that, you need the fourth meaning of the word amen or emuna, which is not belief, but the fourth meaning is imun, which means practice, mm. practice right? exercise. And as I've got to actually exercise, I have to practice, right? I have to do experiments in interior science, whether that's working with ball check and all the exercises that you've created, working with Steiner's exercises, working with the practices of a great tradition. Now, it's in order to actually access knowing, I have to get beneath the surface and actually enter the depth and experience an actual transfiguration. Right, no, there's no gnosis without practice. Only in no. practice yields gnosis. So it's really beautiful. So the the meaning of the word amen, right? The amen, amen means for amen is mistranslated. Comes from the word emuna, e m u n a. It's mistranslated as belief, which creates this entire destruction. But where people look for beliefs, belief is exactly as you said. Belief means I have no access to knowing. I believe when I don't have gnosis. I've got to know. I've got to know. And so just the summit, just so people have it. So amen means trust. Amen means the arms of the nursing mother. Amen means the art form of being a human being, the artist, which is the human being. And it means the practice that gives me access to that knowing. Never believe. Thus the saying, pray and move your feet. In pray other words, feet, brother. you got to participate. Pray and move your feet. Uh, interestingly, too, there's another translation of amen, which comes from Egyptian influence, which is says, I've got it in various books, and I think I've also heard Jordan Maxwell, the expert in symbology, state this, amen is the shortening of Amun ra And so the Egyptians would conclude their prayers or sacred statements with Amun ra which was, of course, the god, sun god, which they worshipped as god. So there's this other... Influence. What, 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 is, what is he saying that uh, Amen is what? What is so Ra? I know. Amen, uh, amen is actually the shortening of Amen Ra. Well, oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. Okay, that's interesting, right? In other but words, the Christians got rid of the Ra for the same reason they turned the devil card in the what was was previously the Ra card, and they've actually got the original Egyptian tarot. And in, in, if you look at the law, of, uh, the law of one by Ra in book four, he shows you the original imprints of the major arcana. And it was not the devil card. It was the Ra card and it represented freedom. And the Christians changed it to the devil card. Beautiful. So I, I did. I never heard this. Amen, Ra. I know only the, the Hebrew structure said, thank you. That's a beautiful piece of information. Madly appreciated. J just one thought that popped into my head while we're talking about belief. One of the most amazing people I ever interviewed, and you'd probably love this interview, is James Carse. Are you familiar with James Carse? I'm not. He wrote the book Finite and Infinite Games, which is phenomenal. Highly recommend it. 
He also wrote a book. He wrote several books, but one of the other books that he wrote, which I read thoroughly and have many, many notes on, is The Religious Case Against Belief. Right. You, you've, you mentioned this. That's right. That's right. Please. Yeah, I've not, I have not read him, but thank you. Okay. Well, he was a professor of theology and philosophy for 38 years at New York University. I interviewed him when he was, I think, 87. I didn't realize he had brain cancer. We had scheduled a follow-up interview. And then I got a call a few days before the interview from someone in his family saying, I'm sorry to tell you, James won't be able to make the interview. He died. So I actually had the last interview with him, which was wow. mind-blowing. And wow. what an amazing man. I mean, 87, sharp as, man. But the, the principle that he conveys in his book, The Religious Case Against Belief, is that religion is an open exploration of God, of love. And belief is a closed system. And so his whole point in the book is that as soon as you become a believer, you actually stop being religious because you stop the open exploration and you have a closed loop, which doesn't grow, right? Yeah, no, that, that, that's gorgeous. I mean, another, that's gorgeous. Another way to dance in that, which is, I think, really helpful and, and, you know, and is fructifying. I just want to say the word fructifying because it's fun. As in fructose, fructifying, it kind of, you know, opens up space. Fruct to, to be, to, fructifying also means the similar to fecundity, to mean uh, fertile, to give birth to. That gives birth to. And I, and I, I, I feel that you're, you're kind of using the word and deploying fecundity, right? Really demonstrates your perspicacity, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and my, and that's your veracity. And there's your veracity, which seems to be indefatigable. Okay, so yeah. there we go. There we go. So, so the relationship between certainty and uncertainty. So in the old religion, one of its mistakes was it identified certainty with the holy and uncertainty with the devil. One way or the other, doubt was the devil. And so you had to actually have belief. You were supposed to believe, which was your certainty. And it was a certainty that it is true. And if you don't believe that it is true, whether that's virginity postpartum or the way that Muhammad and Allah interacted or the chosenness of the Jews, whatever it happens to be, or the Tibetan Buddhist superiority, if you don't believe in that, you don't have certainty about that, then somehow the devils entered the conversation. And that's exactly, that's exactly not right. Right. What we actually need to do is not. It's too childish. It's chi it's not to know. Right. Or to believe, if you will. But in the highest sense, not to know that it is true. It's to know that I am true. In other words, my certainty is a core certainty of being. It's a core certainty that I'm in the field of value, that I'm welcome in the universe and that I'm that I'm an intrinsically valued expression of the field of eros and value. Once I'm in that field of value, once I have that core certainty of experience, of direct experience, of knowing, of knowing, right, then I can hold uncertainty. And then uncertainty opens me up to higher knowing. So when I close my certainty, when I close my, my curiosity, I close my ability to be uncertain too early, I close it down in a false certainty. Then I create dogma, and then I create destructive fanaticisms. Then I'm not open to the field of knowing. So I need to have I need to have a a core certainty of being, which then opens me to uncertainty. That uncertainty takes me to higher certainties, which then open me to new uncertainties. And actually, it becomes a dialectical dance, a beautiful dance of certainty and uncertainty. And I can actually hold them together: the mystery and the gnosis. And it's also totally in line with your description of Eros is that which penetrates and creates novelty. The exactly. belief system just bends the arrow into a circle and there's no, there's no adventure anymore. That's right. And, and so I need to be able to reclaim uncertainty as a spiritual value. And, and that, that, that changes everything. What we think is the, the world of spirits about certainty and the world of materialism or, you know, rationalism, right, is about really recognizing that it's all uncertain. No, 
both certainty and uncertainty are values of cosmos. So when we articulate first principles and first values of cosmos, first principle and first value of cosmos is that there's always mystery and there's always gnosis. There's knowing and unknowing, and those are actual values of cosmos. They're not mistakes. They're not not a problem. There's always certainty and uncertainty. There's always mystery. There's always knowing. And Buddha said, in paraphrase, the only universal law is impermanence, which is uncertainty. Which, which is, yeah, impermanence and uncertainty are deeply related. That's right. And as impermanence means that there's a sense of uncertainty. And, and we need to be able to, to live in that uncertainty, but we can't live there unless I'm grounded in, in real certainties. So for example, and how do you get grounded in real certainties? Let's, here's a great example. You don't get grounded by using the pseudo eros of dogma. Dogma is not eros, it's pseudo eros. Yeah. Pseudo eros is destructive. Dogma covers up the emptiness, right? The whole was pseudo eros, but real eros allows for uncertainty. So you can only hold that uncertainty though if you have certainty. So where do I get certainty from? So I'll just give you a simple example. I love Paul, but that's an absolute certainty. I'm not being cute and I'm not being you know, kind of facetious, I'm actually being completely real. And it's, I have an experience right now in this second of the irreducible gorgeousness and value of Paul and of this conversation. So I have a direct access to an experience of the goodness of this conversation, the truth of this conversation, the beauty of this conversation. And I have, I experience an absolute certainty that it matters what we say to each other, right? That it's not merely entertainment, right? It's not intellectual masturbation, right? It's no. not dating. It actually matters. It's a sacred conversation. And I have certainty about that. Now, once I, once I locate any certainty, any certainty whatsoever takes me into the field of value. So anything that you can be certain about can take you all the way home. Wow. Amen. And, and here's- Amen, right? Amen. Amen. In the real sense, holding in the arms of the breast. Look- And, and, uh, and rock. Amun Ra, the sun, the God. So this is what rose in me as you were speaking. Dogma is death to sex life. <laughs> and the Dogma. whole and the whole universe is sex life, right? That's right. We we live in a that's correct. We live in that's a it's a cosmoerotic universe. Exactly. Reality, reality is kissing all the way up and all the way down. It's always it's always, the line is always penetrating the circle. Luria writes in the 16th century, he writes every moment of reality, every second, every moment, every dynamic, every interchange in the world of matter, in the world of life, in the world of mind is always circle riding the line, line penetrating the circle. It's always lines and circles, meaning, meaning reality is fuck. Yeah, yeah, it's is there it, and it goes right back to the lingam and the yoni, the, the circle and the line, right? It's all right, and as, and and in some sense, if we can be just to say it, and we have to actually, if if you're up for it, maybe at a different time, we should have an entire conversation on the word fuck because it's a misunderstood word, and I know there's a famous Osho clip about it. We can go even much much deeper than we got to talk about the word fuck, but just for now, for a second. If I actually get that reality is eros or reality is fuck, and, and the word fuck adds something to eros. It's not just to be cute. It adds something of the fierceness of it. It's the edge of it, right? In other words, it actually tells you that reality is tender. It's quivering tenderness, and it's wildly fierce. Yes. So if, I get, if I get that reality is fuck, and I get that God is reality, then I get that God is fuck all the way up. And all, all the way, way down. down. Wow. Yep. An endless fuck. Endless, endless holy fuck. Holy endless fucking holy fuck. hell. Holy fucking, that's fucking awesome. It is. We were going to talk about, I, I lost the thread. We were going to talk about needs and we, didn't we forget to we, we did. that? <laughs> we did. We did. We did. We did. So maybe we could, that's a great place that, that, you know, I, I, I think that we need to finish. So let's talk about needs for a second. And you made the distinction. You talked about, you know, why we need to avoid neediness. And we intuitively, right. We, I articulated this distinction between need and neediness. So that's actually a great place to, I mean, 
it's a it's a topic of an entire dialogue, but let's just try and get it briefly, which is something like as follows. Neediness means that I don't have any experience of my own wholeness. I turn to you and ask you to be the source of my wholeness. That's exactly right. That's that's neediness. And that ultimately undermines the integrity of my very being and becoming, the integrity of my wholeness. However, there's a much deeper experience, which is the experience of need. And now we really, really, my brother, Paul, we have to spend an entire two hours just on need. So we're just going to try and just touch this. And maybe it's a, it's a promissory note for, for a future. Yeah. Moment. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it in the air to, to come back to, I mean, we, we have about a thousand podcasts to do. Yeah. But this, the, the need thing is, is huge. So let's just say it as follows. Need is a structure of reality. Reality is evolution. And evolution is love in action in respond, response to need. Evolution is love and action in response to need. And actually, there is no love that doesn't respond to need. And authentic need is sacred. And so we need to reclaim the dignity of need. And one of the tragedies of dogmatic religion and dogmatic kind of Western psychology is both of them failed to actually acknowledge the ultimate dignity of need. You know, the classical image of God is God has no needs. So it's Western, wrong. the Western religion says God has no needs and you should be like God. The, which wh- means the, the why is the who. That's right. That's right. Exactly. The why is the who. So we have a, a caricature of God who has no needs that we're supposed to imitate which debases our needs, because if you're supposed to be like God and God has no needs, you should have no needs. Our vision of the balanced Buddha mind is beyond needs. So now we've got a Western and Eastern notion, which basically debase needs, number one. And number two, we have this notion in Western psychology, which is actually very deep, which is that in order to be a whole human being, you have to actually overcome the humiliation and trying to get your basic needs met. And that's Kohat and Fairburn, right? And, you know, Winnicott and, you know, and Mary Ainsworth and, you know, originating in, in Balby and his book, Separation and Lost, those monumental volumes. There's a whole school, which is very, very important. And actually Martha Nussbaum, who I'm madly in love with, Martha, if you're listening, I'm in love, right? She's a brilliant, you know, kind of serious philosopher, wrote a book, which is complicated to read, but good called The Language of Emotions, some 800-page tome where she, she deals with some of this. But, but this notion that what Western psychology says, you get humiliated in getting your basic needs met, overcoming that humiliation and embracing your need is what you need to do to become healthy and whole. So that's the double bind at the center of culture. On the one hand, we have this debasing of needs that lives in both Eastern and Western spirituality. On the other hand, we have psychology that says, and that that Western psychology lives in China and lives in America, right? You've got to get your needs met and you've got to honor your needs. So we've got one whole school of thought that says, honor your needs, get over the humiliation of getting your basic needs met. That's what actually destroys you in attachment theory. School one. School two, needs are actually opposite of Buddhahood. Needs are opposite of divinity. Become Buddha, become like God, get beyond your needs complete double bind at the center of culture. So what we need to do is we actually need to reclaim the dignity of need. You can only do that in one way. You have to reclaim the divinity of need. You have to realize that actually both Buddhahood and Godhood are not beyond needs. That actually God is so Eros incarnate, which is how we began our conversation. God is so love. God is so Eros that God's willing to need me. Because when I truly love, I'm willing to need. Actually, the ultimate wholeness is to need more wholeness. I'm not whole if I don't need. And that, to link together the whole conversation, is a paradox. It is a beautiful paradox. Beautiful paradox. If I don't need you, there's actually something missing from my wholeness. I'm a wholeness 
that needs more wholeness. And the way Ibn Gabay says it in the 16th century is avoda tzorch gavoa, which is something like your deed is God's need. Mm-hmm. Right? Your deed, and that's how one decision of a Hasidic family, Abram Joshua Heschel, how he interpreted Ibn Gabay's statement. The statement actually is God needs your service. God needs your service, right? And God needs your service is not a meta-theoretical comment. It's unique and personal. It's God turning to Paul and saying, Paul, I like Gaffney, but with all due respect, Gaffney cannot do what Paul can do. So God needs your service. So you imagine the exponentialized, more beautiful goddess than Uncle Sam, who says Uncle Sam wants you. No, it's actually goddess, reality, she, God needs you. You actually have an experience you're needed by reality. You know, I talked, maybe I'll, I'll finish with this. I talked to a, a, a beautiful set of students, friends, partners in Belgium today, and their awesome daughter, and just to respect their privacy, I won't mention her name, is having her communion, you know, this, um, this uh, Saturday. And we were talking about their communion, about the beautiful holy moment of their coming together, their creative passion that created their, their beautiful daughter and how, how their creative passion has to now give her blessing. And, and so they asked me, okay, so what's the blessing we should give her? What's then? Of course, they have their own wisdom and they had a lot to say. But I said, if you add, the blessing you want to give your daughter is that she should know that reality needs her. Yeah. Wow. That's know so, that reality uh, all, all children need to know that. That's right. My dignity is in the knowing that I'm needed, right? And that my needs are therefore also dignified. Reality has needs and I participate in reality and I have needs. And I have, you know, an entire set of needs that are way beyond Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy was talking about a kind of a vision of separate self and the needs of separate self. And maybe we have to have an entirely, you know, new dialogue on how we go beyond Maslow's hierarchy and we, we actually introduce what I call the eight core eros needs. And I'm maybe just, uh, I'll just say them now to conclude, and we can actually do a deep dive dialogue on them. But the eight core eros needs, which we talk about in, in a book that's just about to come out, right, are A, the need for eros. There's a direct need for eros itself, the experience of radical aliveness moving through me desiring ever deeper contact and ever greater need, that experience of, I need Eros. I need that field of aliveness moving in me, right? Becoming in me. So as, A, there's a need for Eros. B, within that need for Eros, I have six personal significance needs that are expressions of the field of Eros. So one is I have a need to be recognized. Two is I have a need to be chosen. And by the way, parentheses, all these needs are bidirectional. I have a need to recognize and be recognized. Yes. I have a need to choose and be chosen. chosen. Yeah. Right? Right. Three is, right, I have, so I have a need to be intended. Right? And I would actually even, if I, if I put them in order, I would actually start with intended. I have a need to be intended, meaning I have a need to know that I'm not an accident of cosmos, that we live in a non-random universe. And that all randomness is in the context of non-randomness. So and a randomness is a, is a feature, but it's, it's all ultimately non-random. It's a non-random cosmos. And, you know, my colleague uh, and, you know, friend Perry Marshall wrote a very, very good, you know, mathematical essay on, you know, the preposterous of suggesting that randomness is the core feature of cosmos, just completely not correct. So, so it's a non-random cosmos, and that non-random cosmos intended you. So when you actually can say reality intended me, that's not an intellectual statement. You can actually feel it in your body. Reality, it feels good. It feels gorgeous. Reality intended me. You actually can have a direct realization. You get underneath your own ego self. And you actually experience the reality that intended me before I was born. There's the who is the why. Right, the who is the why? So I'm, I'm a, I'm intended. So I have a need to know that I'm intended. I have a need to be intended. Right? If you tell your wife the day of your anniversary, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, sweetie, it's the anniversary. Sure, let's go out to a restaurant. You're not in good shape. 
She wants you to intend that day. She wants you to think about that day, to intend, to pick a place, to pick the right table. So we have a need to be intended, not just by one person, but by reality itself. And we have a need to intend. One. Two, we have a need to be recognized. And we have a need to recognize. But that need to be recognized, what we do is, and the need to be intended. And three, we have a need to be chosen and a need to choose. Four, we have a need to be not loved, but to be love adored. And adored is more than love. We have a need to be love adored and to love adore, right? Four, five, we have a need to be desired and we have a need to desire. Yes. And finally, six, the six personal significance need and the seventh in our list of needs, because Eros was one, the need for Eros, the six personal significance need in the field of Eros is we have a need to need and we have a need to be needed. Mm. Yeah, let, me, let me just add one thing. All needs that are legitimate and clarified needs are rights. They're also rights. Authentic needs are rights. It's an actual right, which means I have a right to Eros. I have a right to be intended. I have a right to be chosen. I have a right to be recognized. I have a right to be love adored, right? I have a right to be desired and I have a right to be needed. And our sacred obligation as people concerned with evolving the source code and creating a new human and a new humanity in a just society is we have to organize society to allow it to meet the intrinsic rights of human beings. So the notion, I'm going to just take one. The notion that a person has a right to be desired is a huge idea, right? And that that idea is mocked today. There's actually a a particular writer, um, you know, in in Oxford who wrote a book called you know something like the right to desire or something like that, which mocks the right to desire and identifies it with kind of the incel community. No, no, no. The right to be desired is a sacred, intrinsic right. I have a right to be desired. That that's such a it's so gorgeous. And so these are bidirectional. Their needs, their intrinsic needs, and their rights, which means we have an obligation, which emerges from our love, our field of love, to create a society that allows those needs to be met. And finally, the eighth need is I have a need to transform. I have a need to grow and transform. I have an actual need to grow and transform, right? For, but not just for me to grow and transform and for me to cause growth and transformation, that that's a that's a that's a huge 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 piece, and it's 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 wildly wildly important. And and you know, and thank you for for ending with that because it completely changes our experience of reality. Well, you know, I think that why it's so important, especially as such a beautiful ending, is because it gives us all eight very good reasons to live, love, share, and feel very alive, and to pursue our natural curiosity and inquis inquisitiveness to be aware that belief systems can be detrimental to meeting those needs. Like the guy that wrote the book about, uh, you were just talking about, was it the desire to be needed? He was against. There was actually a, um, there's a particular, um, feminist writer who's writing from Oxford now who wrote a book about the right to desire, but, but and essentially mocking that and identifying it with the incel community, which is, a, which is, does she couldn't, she literally couldn't grasp the notion that there could be a right to desire. And part of the reason was she had no narrative of desire. She was operating with almost a secular materialist narrative of desire. So the right to desire to her appeared to be an aberration, which appears in the fringes of the incel community, which is where she identified the right to desire and identified it with this pathological she essentially identified the right to desire with its most pathological forms, which is a disaster. It, it is. To me, that's what happens when you find God in your head instead of your heart. Right. Or, 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 or not even in your head. Right. Yeah. Or someone else's head. I, I, I'm very grateful for this conversation, this dialogue. And, and thank you for deepening my um, sense of connection to God and to love and to you and, and to life and to meaning and to value and to gorgeous the the you know the last core need of eros you know that that need to constantly expand and explore and evolve 
I think that's really why I do these podcasts. And I think that, um, I, I, I think that we've both given everybody listening a lot to really, uh, be present with, to imbibe, to digest, to explore, to contemplate, um, to practice and yeah. to, to, to even challenge. I mean, I would say challenge everything that we've said. But pay attention to what happens inside of your body, because whenever you're challenging a fundamental truth, it creates a sense of disconnection inside of you. To challenge the notion of the primacy of love will give you a definite visceral sensation that may go very against the belief that your mind is trying to justify. And I think, I think real honest deep thinking and exploration cannot be separated from the wisdom of the body and that's one of the reasons that you have to be a healthy person to really do deep thinking yeah because if you're detached from your body you're already detached from reality and thinking from that perspective can only mirror the the dysfunction that is underneath it yeah and that and that's the tragedy of so much thinking when i was in oxford at the uh I, I was writing my my doctoral thesis at the Bodleian Library, and re, which is a very beautiful library. Right outside the Bodleian Library, there's a picture of five men, which represents Oxford. Five men from the head up, right? Yeah, yes. Right? As as if you could actually have a head without a body, right? And as, as if our mind could actually work. And really, the head is the expression of the full somatic intelligence of every muon, and the allurement of every muon actually moving up and around and through you, right? Which is, right, divinity incarnate, which is of course, you know, the, the tragedy of AI is that AI is seeking computational mind intelligence, which is disembodied, meaning detached, right? Decontextualized from the field of value. It's what Nick Bostrom calls the value uploading problem to AI, right? AI doesn't know how to access value because value, right, comes from, Right, a deeper sense than raw computational power. You know, the head is like a mailbox for every cell in the body. And if you only yeah. look at the mail and don't know where it came from, you can never find context for it. <laughs> so then you just have to imagine shit. Gorgeous. What a delight, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much. And, th and I'll say thank you to all my sponsors for your amazing products and love and support and thank you to all of you that purchase anything from the sponsors it's a great uh gift to you your health your family and it's also supporting the podcast so thank you very much and thank you to each of you i think if you've made it this far in the conversation i would suspect that you have a real understanding of the importance of what we're talking about today and how important it is for each of us to live this and practice it and, and, and celebrate all these things so that we can actually go out and inspire people to challenge their own belief systems, find their heart and think beyond belief systems and dogmas. And also to keep room in our heart for the people that are lost, confused and scared in the world, because there's, there's, it's easy to be in that state today. And I think one of the reasons I've spent so much of my life exploring God and love and all these things is because as a child, I was in a confused parental environment for my entire childhood where there was a lot of violence and a lot of fear and a lot of insecurity. And my early exposure to God was through the Christian church and it scared the hell out of me and nobody would answer my questions. So what it sparked in me was the realization that I couldn't trust adults to tell me the truth about anything because if the truth was what they had and it led to that much violence, then there really was no room for God in the experience. So as a child, I realized I had to take it upon myself to find what is true and what makes me feel centered in my heart. And that's been the quest of my life and finding people like you uh, really help the child and me feel good to know there's adults on the planet that actually 
have connected their mind and their heart together and have their arms out and can take anybody to the breast of Eros, you know, and I think we've got a lot of breasts being removed and it starts right in a lot of these religious systems. They cut the breasts right off the divine mother and they even call her a man and look at the confusion that's extended itself right into the moment with all that. No, no and, so, and God is actually El Shaddai, right? In the original Hebrew, God who is the breast. Yeah. And I, so my point is, is these kinds of conversations I think are just nutrition for the soul and it's why I do this. And I'm excited to do more with you. With delight, my friend. You, you are an absolute delight and a, a breath of wonder. Right? A breath Thanks, of buddy. Wonder you too. The psych. I love you madly, sir. Really, love you madly. Look, I, I'm glad I am not God in totality because I would not have been able to have this amazing experience with you, right? So the the beauty of the individuality and the uniqueness of the myriad expressions of the divine is that we can actually celebrate the power of God's creativity in the creation of each of us and each other and nature itself. And I think we've forgotten how important it is to celebrate diversity and in my last comment in this regard is what the World Economic Forum is doing is wiping out diversity and trying to create a monologue robotic reality. And anytime you do that in nature, you kill nature, right? So I think what we're doing is feeding the the the, the illusion with some love. No, no, gorgeous. And of course, you, you have in your inimitable and beautiful style opened up an entirely new topic, right? So I think what we said that our next dialogue you suggested or we suggested before we went live, we have to do self versus the World Economic Forum. Yes, I'm writing it down. Now, would you like that with a capital S-E-L-F or a small S-E-L-F? Capital S it is, my friend. Capital S all the way. Capital S all the way with delight. That's actually really important. We relate to, you know, it's really the World Economic Forum. It's the MIT Media Lab, you know. Um, but 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 I think that's a really important to understand, you know, what's happening here and and to be able to actually articulate right, a cogent worldview that says why techno manipulation and techno feudalism actually not from a Luddite perspective, technology is sacred and important, but the way that it's being done today actually not only violates value, but it actually brings us to the death of humanity. It was a big deal. I am all for it. We will reconvene all of us together with Mark and I for self versus the World Economic Forum. This is the ultimate wrestling match. This the is ultimate. the ultimate love affair. This is the ultimate greased pig contest. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah, brother. <laughs> all right, bud. Lots love of love you. to all of you. Thank you so much for staying with us. And we both send you our love. So we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Mark Gaffney. You can find Mark online at markgaffney.com. That's M-A-R-C-G-A-F-N-I.com. Or connect with him on Instagram and Twitter at Mark Gaffney and on Facebook and LinkedIn at Dr. Mark Gaffney. You can watch more on his YouTube channel, Mark Gaffney. Mark offers a free weekly broadcast, plus listeners can download chapters one to four of the award-winning Your Unique Self book by going to onemountainmanypaths.org forward slash your hyphen unique hyphen self. That's onemountainmanypaths.org forward slash your hyphen unique hyphen self. His books, Your Unique Self, The Radical Path to Personal Enlightenment, and A Return to Eros, The Radical Experience of Being Fully Alive, are available on Amazon and at all good bookstores. His mini course, Your Unique Self, can be taken free at uniqueselfinstitute.com forward slash the dash unique dash self dash mini dash course. That's unique selfinstitute.com forward slash the dash unique dash self dash mini dash course. 
You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can also watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. A big thank you to our sponsors by Optimizers, Paleo Valley, and Organifi. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products they produce. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcasts.